Yeah, so Brecht introduced the SAFE project briefly just then, but I'm going to kind of go into a bit more depth about what it is and all the kind of funky, exciting stuff we plan to do with it, or maybe don't. Who knows? So um, no one's really fully discussed musical semantics yet. So this is SAFE, if you didn't know. Brecht did mention semantic audio feature extraction. It's, it has a cool initialism, so, or is it an acronym? Which one's which? I can't remember. But anyway, I digress. So musical semantics. We're talking about the, the meaning of music. So we, there's several different fields. We've got speech recognition, which we're not doing. We've got musical informatics, so that's kind of, kind of computer score recognition and things, stuff that we're not doing. The semantic web, there's a couple of semantic web guys sat in the back over there who are probably excited that I talked about the semantic web. We're kind of doing that, but I'm not going to talk about it today. Sorry. They have some posters downstairs if you want to look at some semantic web stuff. Signal separation, we're, we're not doing that either. But it's all on here. It's all under this, this vague um, title of musical semantics. So there, there are various applications. So. Um, kind of iTunes, kind of music suggestion, their magic playlists or whatever they call them. Does anyone know the actual name? Um, and Spotify have their music recommendation and Pandora, if that still exists. You can't use it in England anymore because they broke it. Um, cover song identification, we'll talk about that a bit, bit later, but can you recognize what song it is? Obviously, we can quite easily hear a song and go, oh, that's a cover of who and what's it. You're not being original, get out. Can a computer do that for us? I've talked about music transcription or that. Automatic remixing, so give a computer a song and say, remix that in this style, make it sound cool. Digital archiving kind of goes along with similarity. We're trying to archive things, make them searchable easily, or get me all the things in E minor with ugh, some other stuff. Wicked. And performance analysis, how well are people playing? Izzy is not in the room, but he kind of works in that field. So kind of teaching tools for musicians, analyzes how well you are playing, where you're going wrong, how you might improve your technique, what areas you need to work on and things. So there, there's lots of applications and such. But our main area with the SAFE project, we're looking at this kind of semantic tools for, for mixing audio, for music production. So I assume everyone in this room has something to do with music or audio, at least slightly, because you're at an AES seminar, workshop, whatever this is. So music producers often use these, these weird words, which people not affiliated with the field might find strange. The bass needs to be tighter. The toms are ringing at the door. The vocal needs to be more prominent in the mix. Prominent, maybe this one, most people can understand. Ringing toms, maybe people can understand. Tighter bass, ugh. Um, I'm not even sure what that means. That's why we're doing this project, so we can find out. But the issue here is we need to be very trained music production professionals in order to achieve these things. So we look at the, the knobs and dials on all these wacky bits of gear we have, and they're labeled with things like compression ratio, Q factor, and density which has no real correlation with these things up here. There's not a nice, ooh, tighten the bass knob. There's not a stop that ringing tom knob. And there's not a, I was about to say promenade the vocals. That doesn't make sense. Make the vocals more prominent knob on our devices. So how do we, our music professionals who've trained for years to go, oh, I'll actually, I'll put a compressor on it. I'll do with this with the ratio. I'll do this with the attack. Then I'll put a reverb after it. And, and in the end, we end up with this nice, tight, non-ringing, prominent bass vocal or something. We want to come up with some way of having a computer decide what to do with all these parameters. here to make these things up here happen. And us noobs, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a music mixing noob, I, I wish I had some of my uh, undergrad projects to show you. They're terrible. So us noobs, we're like, oh, I just, I just, just make it warm for me. Just make it tight, and then, and then I'll be happy. That's, that's what we want. So can we 
provide abstractions for these low level effect parameters to make a more intuitive interface. So we, we kind of think, oh, I want to make this warmer. And there might be a knob labeled warm. We go, oh, that sounds warmer now. Sweet. I didn't have to think. Hurrah. Can we make the production workflow more efficient? So whereas for noobs, it might be a, a nice thing to get started. For professionals, it might be, it just speeds up the whole process rather than thinking, oh, I've got to do that and that and that. You just go slap that on, bish, bash, bosh. And you can, as Brett was saying earlier, we can, we can start to work more on the, the creative areas of the mixing rather than having to worry about all these technical aspects. And along the way, can we get a load of useful metadata um, about things? So do people who mix in, in Sweden, do people use different musical mat semantics to, to people in England somewhere? All this useful metadata, which we can kind of gather along the way. Oh, how are we going to solve the problem? Obviously, Lee Scratch Perry would know how to solve the problem. But in this photo, he looks like he doesn't. He's, he's on the case, I'm sure. What is happening? <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, that's done. Let's have lunch. Oh, no. uh, it's, it's over. <laughs> Lee, Lee wants everyone to have lunch. So uh, Ryan mentioned the, the moose earlier. It's not really a moose, but we call it a moose. He's our friend. He's going to rescue us with his little safe project that we have. So it's the, the project of edge of what I just said. We want to extract semantic metadata during the mixing process. So what we're trying to do is provide kind of a, as transparent a process as possible into people's production workflows so they can provide us with this data without getting in the way of what they're actually doing. And we, we, ha we came up with loads of ideas, and we settled on, on this in the end. And then use this data we're collecting from that to feed back into the production workflow to make it more efficient, to allow this kind of semantic control I've been talking about. So the, the idea we, we settled on was to create a suite of plugins, the safe plugins. And there are a set of audio plugins, VSTs, audio units, no DigiDesign or now Avid plugins because you can't get hold of their SDK to do research, so poo to them. <laughs> um, and people can use these effects to, to save this semantic terms about the audio they're working on within their DAW. And it works like a normal plugin, and you type in, oh, that, that was warm. You can add some metadata, it's on the bass track, I'm producing hip hop, and I'm in Belgium or something like that. And we can all send it off. And then that's all compiled on our server. And then you can also load terms. So this is how it's feeding back in to make the, the workflow more efficient. As we get more and more people saving warm base things, then people can go, oh, I'm doing a base, and I want it to be warm. And we can give them some kind of parameter settings that will make their base warm. So here's a nice little diagram that kind of just explains that. Here's our, our safe compressor. You kind of type, oh, tinny in that box. Can you use a compressor to make something tinny? Don't know, who cares? We're going to save it. It's going to go over here. We've got semantic descriptors. We've got the parameter space, all the parameter settings here. And then the features of the audio. So if anyone's familiar with Tomball research, we've got a lot of different low-level features of audio, MFCCs, BART coefficients, spectral centroids, and what have you, which kind of mathematically describe a sim signal and we kind of try and map them to these semantic terms. It all gets stored on the server somewhere, and then when someone wants to load something, it can use all these kind of special machine learning techniques and things to map back onto the parameters there and hopefully work. That's, that's the thing. So yeah, that's just what's getting saved. So whatever semantic term they typed in the box, the settings of the parameter of the effect, the features of the audio before and after they were processed. So we're actually looking at the transform applied by the plugin there. So what changes did it make to spectral centroid? What changes did it make to the attack time? Whatever. Um, metadata about the audio and the user. So where the user's from. What their primary language is. So there's, there's quite a lot of foreign language words in our database. Um, and, or people who didn't initially speak English, maybe are quite bad at English, 
are they using these semantic terms differently? So that, that's kind of useful information to have. And then the genre and the instrument, uh, useful things to have as well. And it's all sent away and we can, we can play with it. So currently we're just using lib extract in the plugins and I've mentioned some audio features already. Um, but newer versions and a new kind of API we're working on that I'll talk about later, we're using VAMP plugins. So VAMP plugins uh, were developed at Queen Mary, there's lots of Queen Mary people here today. Um, basically, they're a, a kind of audio plugin that their job is to extract audio features. So the newer versions of the safe plugins will actually be VAMP hosts, so you can customize them for your own research. So you say, oh, I want to use these crazy um, features which lib extract doesn't support, but there's a VAMP plugin for it. Ta-da, we can, we can do those things because we have them available to us. And then I've talked about loading settings. You, you can load them. Currently at the moment there's no um, separation on the database. It just uses, F, so you, you load warm in the compressor, it'll look at every warm saved in the compressor and kind of use them to give you some parameter settings. Whereas in the future, it more, what we need to do is get more people to put the metadata in. You'll see later that not many people put metadata in, which if you do use these plugins, put loads of metadata in, it'll make it better for you. But rather than looking at all the warms in the compressor, we'll look at all the warms in the compressor that were for a funk guitar. And hopefully that will tailor the given parameter settings a bit better. So the plugins are all on our website. As Ron said earlier, you know, we're, oh, come on, work link. It's not gonna work, is it? Preview, what's it doing? Um, so where's the browser? Everything's gone mad. So here's our website. There's the moose again. Here's a little video you can watch later if you want. Um, but download, there we go. There are the plugins. They're all there. Go and download them, use them. That is our hidden agenda, which we're making not so hidden. Um, where's thing of me gone? That one. Is it gonna go right? Yeah. So, the aim here is we're trying to work it into everyone's, as far flung as we can get into people's workflows. Download them, give them a try. They're really good. Here we go. This, this isn't a video off the website, but this is a different video that kind of shows you what they do, how they work, um, and some other stuff. Hopefully <coughs> the sound works. That didn't work. <laughs> I, I, I just copied the word, didn't I? Let's watch a video. There we go. Well, I hold the bill. Crikey, <laughs> bloody O'Reilly. Which one's this plugged into, Matt? Uh, <laughs> that was that was loud. Like I'm trying to keep my pants up, hands up. Never drop your guard when I'm around. I'm the champ. You a rookie. Hey, friend, this is good, but I think um, the synth needs more crunk. Let's dial it in. These drums need to be the fatness. Let's load it in from safe. Man, that is fat! That is a wrap. 
Let's celebrate. Up with this loop so I can keep my fans up. That's why I hold the belt like I'm trying to keep my pants up. Hands up, never drop your guard when I'm around. I'm the champ. You a rookie and won't even mess around. See me knocking down this game with these punches and these hooks. Rap taking like I hit you with some punches and some hooks. Yeah, you know I never. Man, these results are statistically significant. <laughs> so that, that's the safe plugin. Please, please don't put words like crunk and fatness in, because I'm really sure they don't mean anything, but they're funny. So it's good for a video. So we've got the plugins. They've probably been out for about a year and a half now. When did we release them? They've, yeah. So they've been out for a while now. There was a, a big kind of peak of interest when they first came out, and then they faded into obscurity. But now there's going to be another peak in interest. We're going to look at our website statistics. There'll be a peak. We'll get so many more things from you guys. Please, please, please. Um, so currently, these uh, the top descriptors in the database. You might notice that warm and bright here have a lot more entries in the database than any other descriptor. That's because we've been running experiments here where we ask people to make things warm and bright. So we're, we're not just using these plugins out in the world. We're using them here for more kind of restricted experiments where we actually ask people, oh, look, here's, here's a guitar loop. Make it bright. Um, so we're getting some more kind of structured data from there. Um, some of the other data is very unstructured. So there's 2,001 entries in total at the moment. There might be a few more. They trickle in at about three a week at the moment. It's really good. Um, and of that, there's, there's 128 semantic terms that are used more than four times. So, well, these are the top six here. Crunch, air, room, punch, and so on and so forth. And then per plugin, we've, we've got kind of the top terms per plugin here. And you start to see weird, weird things come in, like somewhere it says sofa. I can't, yeah, look, there's 15 instances of sofa in the compressor. I don't, I don't know what sofa means. I, I don't know if it's the same guy saving sofa 15 times, or there's a big community of producers out there who like to use the word sofa to describe their compression. You'll also notice in a few places, uh, things don't seem right, like subtle, no one can spell subtle. It's because like some natural language processing has been applied to these. So I can't remember what the exact term was, the lexical something or others, the, the morphological thingamies or whatever. So things like crunchy, crunchier, crunchiest, they all get changed down to just crunch. So that's happening there. So that it's not just 12 people put nice, some people might put nicer or other things. Nice is a really vague term as well, and together. Um, so there's that. And we can take all that data, and we can order it by popularity and things. Uh, then one of the, the more kind of useful things we're doing, maybe, maybe useful is to make the other stuff seem too bad, but the more exciting things, I think, is this dimensionality reduction stuff. So we, we have this multiple dimensionality data. So say we take the um, compressor, for example, that has five parameters. So for each descriptor we have, we have five different parameter values. So that's kind of five dimensional space, which we can't really think about. So we can reduce those dimensions down into two, but maintain the kind of distances between them in that space or the kind of variance across things, or there's loads of different dimensionality reduction things. Ryan's probably the guy to talk about, or Spiros if he was here, but he's, he's not about. Um, but anyway, so one of them, and we can do that with the, the parameter settings. We can do that with the audio features. I mean, audio features, currently there's 80 different audio features for each bit of audio. So that's an 80 dimensional space that's getting brought down into two dimensions or three dimensions or whatever we decided to do. Um, and then uh, on top of that, we can, we can apply some kind of agreement score. So as we saw there, 15 people or one guy 15 times haven't decided, saved sofa in the compressor. 
So if it is all different people, how well do they agree on what SOFA means? How similar are the parameter settings that they use to create SOFA? How similar are the audio features that they described as SOFA? And we can calculate an agreement score, and in the next few graphs, the agreement of that descriptor is given by the size of the text, which will all make sense here. So this is the parameter space of the distortion. So you can see grain is really big here, so that has the highest agreement. And well, the other ones are about the place. So th this one kind of makes sense. Some of them are a bit messy. I mean, that one's just got stuff on top of each other. We'll look at it in a bit. But you can see here, we kind of got subby to tinny. So this dimension here, we can start to think about if we looked at the audio features, I haven't actually done it because I just made this graph the other day. But you would expect, I mean, subby, it's going to be lots of low frequency, tinny, lots of high frequency. So perhaps this is some kind of spectral tilt feature on this axis here. And then the other way, We've got shredded over here and kind of warm over here, warm tube. Um, the other dimension isn't as well defined in what you can read there, but perhaps there is some kind of audio feature that um, correlates with that axis there. And then we can do the same things with the, the features. So this is just the process features, just the, audi the audio features of the, whatever the audio was after it's been processed. And you can see everything's kind of bunched up here. It doesn't, doesn't work too great, that. And that's kind of an issue with how I produce this graph, because a lot of the audio features might not have actually been changed at all. Quite a lot of the temporal things might not have changed from this distortion that was applied. So you've got lots and lots of data that's not actually changing in your dimensionality reduction algorithm. So it gets, it, it gets a bit angry at you and just bunks it all in the same place. And the same thing happened there. This is actually looking at the difference between the, the processed audio features and the unprocessed audio features to create a thing. It's kind of put warm and crunch on top of each other. Maybe that makes sense. Uh, and crunchy is behind grainy. Uh, yeah, it didn't really work, that one. What we can also do is create clusters from these things. So maybe there's a, a cluster around here, this little crust, cluster over here of shredded, fat, and decimated. And I don't know how many people are familiar with dendrograms. Anyone who's done any kind of reading in tombral research will be sick of dendrograms because uh, I hate them. But they kind of show things. I prefer like circles. But we've got kind of these clusters down here. So you, you kind of look at it as the distance, the similarity of two things is represented by how short a distance joins them in this kind of tree here. So we've got decimated over here. and cha over here have the longest distance between them, so they're kind of the, the most dissimilar. But we've kind of got these represented by the colors, these bottom bits of the trees are kind of clusters. So it kind of makes sense here. We've got warm cream beef base rasp crunch drive is all kind of one little cluster there. Warm and cream are a little micro cluster within that, which kind of makes sense to me. Crush and deaf and saw, I don't know what saw means, but these are all pretty similar over here. And distort, harsh, bright, destroy. So there, there are some kind of, to, to someone who maybe uses these words a bit more often, is a bit more experienced with uh, audio production, can start to see that these clusters sort of make sense, these clusters that we've arrived at. Um, we can actually, all the data is available online, so you can access it all if you have any wish to. Um, there's, there's a kind of couple of sites. So this is a little site which there will be at some point a kind of web API for accessing this stuff. It's not really public yet, but there's this little website which uses that API. So we can just grab all the safe equalizer data for warm and we'll get like a little bit of JSON over here in a second, which just has all the parameter data and all the audio feature data within it. So. If you fancy using any of this data to do any analysis with, go ahead, it's there. It's all, all there for you to use. Um, that's not my presentation. Where's it gone? I lost it. I did lose it. Hello. There we go, we came back. So, I'll, I'll show you another thing at the end. We, we do plan to have a, a bit more of a pretty looking 
interface online with all kind of special visualizations and things, which I'll show you, show you at the end what it looks like now. So what do we plan to do in the future? This guy is futuristic as anything. He goes in all my presentations now. Uh, one day I hope he does come to one. I think he is a, a kind of computer music researcher. He's from Stanford University or something. He's cool. So there's a poster about this downstairs, which you can maybe look at over, over sandwiches later. But this is kind of a, a reduced dimensionality interface. So we've got these reduced dimensionality plots. So imagine kind of plotting that on some kind of XY slider, and you can move about. So say warm was down here. We kind of got crunchy over here, something else over here. And you can move that little dot about and move through these tombras in a kind of clustered kind of manner. Um, yeah, there, there's a poster about that downstairs. Yeah, I, that's probably got more information than I could tell you currently. Or off Ryan, he, he worked with Spiros on that. And so did Jason, wherever Jason is. Jason's run away. How dare he. Um, and then we have, so we have a, a C++ API for developing new safe plugins. So if any of you fancy doing any kind of tailored research in this kind of area and want to use this kind of thing, we have a, a C++ API, which is built up on top of Juice. So it's, it's all really easy to use and stuff, um, which basically takes care of all the audio feature extraction, talking to our server, and all that stuff. Basically, all you have to bung in is whatever DSP you want and point at any VAMP plugins you want to use, if there's any features you want to use. And you can have a, a plugin which has all this functionality in it for you and do some, do some research. Um, it's not really live yet, so, but keep your eyes peeled if you want to do that. It's, it's nearly there, it's, it's all, all right. And then even further in the future, one, one of our ideas is that we want to kind of abstract this even further to the point of having the loaded terms applicable to any plugin. So can we kind of come up with generic parameters? So say, oh look, We've got all this information about how people use distortion to make things fuzzy or warm. Can someone then ask, hey, look, I'm using this distortion plugin that I've got from somewhere. Uh, can you tell me how to make something warm with this? Can we use machine learning in some fashion to take all our audio feature data, all our parameter data from these other plugins, map them onto that plugin, and make it warm with that one? So it's, it's a much more general thing. People don't have to use our crummy plugins. They can use their favorite distortion plugin that some really famous guy used, and they're like, oh, I've got to use that one, because Bill uses it. Who's Bill? And even, even further abstracted than that, someone who's just completely starting out might not even know what effect to load. So that situation I just talked about, someone's like, using a distortion, but don't know how to use it. This guy, he, he has no idea. He's, oh, I've got <laughs> just tell me how to do it. So it just says, oh, I want to make this warm. It's, it's, a, it's a guitar. And our algorithms are genius machine. We'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, bung a compressor on it, and then, then bung a distortion after it. Yeah, you're golden, mate. So that, that's kind of the, the top end of the road, this kind of automatic super mixing machine along the same lines as what Josh was talking about earlier. You've got everything in there, and it just does it for you. And then you can kind of say, oh, you're there saying, oh, I want that to be warm and that to be tinny. Who wants things to be tinny? But we can make them tinny. Um, and you're just, rather than controlling the effects, you're controlling the, the shape, the image, the creative vision that you have in your head. And yeah, thanks. <laughs>